Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and you are at the intersection of sexuality and religion, where it meets at LGBTQ Avenue and LDS Street. Thank you for giving us an hour of your time to better understand this intersection. We always uh, are thankful for, the, for those who are watching on a video version of the podcast episode. Uh, through one of our podcast players like YouTube uh, and Facebook, we invite you to participate in this episode by using the comment section uh, of YouTube and Facebook to share your thoughts and feelings as we go through this episode. Uh, as I tease, this is really an exciting opportunity to better understand this intersection and uh, the story that we're going to present today. We also want to welcome those who are listening on an audio version of the podcast through one of the audio podcast players, Stitcher, iTunes, uh, Google, and also those who are now listening on the Amazon Podcast uh, Prime Network. We are thankful for those. Uh, many of you who have uh, supported and shared and subscribed to various podcast players, it was enough that Amazon picked us up as a Amazon podcast uh, provider. So thank you to those who are listening from the Amazon family. Now, uh, without further ado, I want to welcome uh, Richard Mitchell to the Latter-day Stories podcast and uh, excited to have you in studio to be able to share your story. Welcome. Thank you. It's, it's uh, nerve wracking, but good to be here. It is a little nerve wracking and uh, I don't think it gets in any easier even for me uh, on the other <laughs> side because I think of all of the things we should talk about and, and how we should structure an interview. And I think um, your story is going to be fascinating because not only um, were you just kind of navigating this um, world like so many of us, uh, so many of us gay men with a family, with children, with a career. But as we're going to talk about in today's episode, you also were a former bishop who comes out, which is um, a topic that we don't get to talk about often in the Latter-day Story studios. Uh, so I'm excited to be able to, to kind of intersect that aspect of your story as well, to be able to share um, for other church leaders out there who are in similar situations where they are counseling with people across the desk um, and, and in many respects, punishing them for who and what they are. And they themselves are experiencing some of those same feelings and thoughts and experiences in their, their own life. So I think that'll be a fascinating part of the story. As we also talked about, um, we uh, were teased in the, the lead up to the episode. We're also um, going to discuss divorce and mixed orientation marriages, conversion and aversion therapy at BYU and, and a little further down into your life. So kind of a wide gamut of discussion, which is uh, super exciting. So that aside, for those who don't know who Richard is, give us a little background. Uh, tell us where you live, what you, what you do for a living and, and who Richard is. Sure. Um, so... I currently live in um, the Phoenix area, and uh, I am a retired Army officer, and I currently own an IT services company where I provide IT services to various uh, companies and corporations here in the area. Um, do you want more about... Uh, I will just say this. Um, I was born a member of the church. Um, my father was born and raised in England, so I uh, was more, I, I say I was raised more like a British um, son than an American son. Um, mother was uh, born here in the US, in Utah, but uh, definitely from Mormon stock, uh, pioneers, etc. cetera. And uh, yeah, so lifelong member of the church, um, uh, growing up, etc. and the, um, a lot there, a lot of culture there. And I think that I'll, we'll have a, a pretty deep dive discussion about that family life and what Mormonism really meant to you um, growing up. But I think the, we maybe start this conversation with the elephant in the room. Um, it's one thing to completely understand um, Mormonism and the, the role Mormonism plays in our lives. But I'm more interested in the part where we talk about the difference. At what point did you realize there's something about you that's not like everyone else? At what point do you realize I'm different? Yeah, sure. So I think like a lot of people, um, I could reach back 
as far as four years old and always thought I was different. Um, I'm one of seven children in our family and always felt like I was the odd man out uh, in many situations. Uh, but definitely growing up in the church and turning 12, um, being now a full-fledged member of scouts and a deacon, that's when now your interaction is forced um, with other young men your own age and older young men. And um, the, you know, the absolute knowledge that I was attracted to my friends and not other girls was super apparent. Um, but it also led to a lot of heartache and difficulty because everything we're taught in the church, especially um, at the time that I was 12, was things like being gay was next to a murder or was, you know, the, the abomination or the, um, uh, anyway, just a deviant of a very deep, uh, a, a deep type. Those were all descriptors that, uh, as you were kind of rolling through those, that were all familiar in the miracle of forgiveness. These were all words that were coined by Spencer W. Kimball, specific to people like you and me, um, adulterers, um, pedophiles, criminals, um, deviants, um, maladies, all descriptors that the, an apostle who eventually become the prophet of the church uh, used to describe us. Well, and, and they became a constant ringing in the ear because, um, I, I mean, you read Miracle of Forgiveness because that was the book that was sort of taught to us to sort of straighten you out when you weren't on the straight and narrow all the time. And uh, I can remember reading through it multiple times and never feeling better about myself and more specifically about my chances for eternal life it only made me feel like there was no way I was ever going to make it. And it, that's, that is no, um, that's no situation that any 12, 13, 14, 15 year old kid should ever grow up uh, living, experiencing, or, or dealing with. That, so I had to have, to, I'm just curious, did that take a negative um, or create a negative impact in your youth? Um, of course, psychologically it does. I think that from a more practical standpoint, what it did is it tried to make me become a perfect person. In other words, every aspect of my life, whether it was school, I was a straight A student, but I was a straight A student, I think largely because I was always trying to prove a point that I wasn't this terrible abomination, but instead that there was some you know, there was, there was some redeeming light in me that maybe, maybe somebody could see as worthy, um, even though the deep, deep secret within me was always going to be the real descriptor of who I was. I'm really curious about your family experience and family life. Um, growing up in a super orthodox and very uh, religious home, whether it be Mormonism or even uh, other religions that are uh, orthodox and conservative by nature, what, um, if anything, did your family uh, speak about or talk about um, in terms of this topic? Do you remember? Um, <laughs> to be honest, we were, a, we were an Orthodox Mormon family, meaning we went to church every week. And you got to know that back then you would go to primary on Tuesdays or young men, young women on Wednesdays. And then there was early morning priesthood on Sunday and then back for Sunday school. And then even back later on in the evening for um, sacrament. And we didn't live in Utah. We lived in Indiana at the time as I was growing up. And so all of these were long drives, but we made them because going to church and being an active and good member of the church was our single most important thing. Um, I would say that from the standpoint of my parents, they were orthodox, but with faults. And I would say the biggest fault of my dad, according to him, was the fact that he was a single um, money earner for the family raising seven kids. And so we didn't have money and he certainly didn't have money to pay tithing. And so 
Um, if you think about it, that's a very important rule. My parents didn't go to the temple because they were non-tithe payers, even though they were, they were married in the temple. Um, but it was always that one aspect of our Mormon life that we weren't at that perfect state. And so it made me want to strive for that even more. And if I can share this one story, my dad did not baptize me. And he, sorry, he tells me later in life, he didn't baptize me because he was a non-tithe payer, so he didn't feel worthy to do that. Um, the man who did baptize me actually turned out to be a pretty bad person and ended up um, being excommunicated from the church. And that, that sort of stuck with me forever in terms of how I would try to relate to my own worthiness in the church is that um, as much as my dad I felt was worthy, but because of something simple like tithing, um, not because he didn't want to pay it, but because he literally could not afford to pay tithing and take care of seven kids. Um, but yet other people were so-called worthy to baptize me, but really weren't. So that, that will definitely play a factor down the road in my own church life. Um, but I, I, will, I want to say this too. We, we had a great family. In other words, my brothers and sisters, we did a lot together. We, our, our vacations were camping with my parents, not going to Disneyland or things like that. Um, we're still very close today, but we never talked about sex. We definitely never talked about gay. I will tell you the one thing is one time I was called a fag and I had no idea what it meant. So I asked my oldest sister, Wanda, and she told me that, and this is not to disrespect anybody, but she told me, Richard, don't worry. A fag means a black person who wears a fur coat. And honestly, it was her lack of understanding what that word even meant, but she wanted to give me a description that would not be me so that I didn't worry about whether that was a label that fit me. It was, and I'm thinking uh, earlier in the episode, you said your father was from England, which um, fag in England has a completely different. Yeah, it's a cigarette. A cigarette. <laughs> that's very true. So I just thought that's funny that even there was an opportunity to, to escape that just by using some culture from the family. But. Sure. Interesting how, how that unfolds. What was uh, high school life like? Um, knowing that you felt that you were different uh, around 12 years of age, so you're kind of entering into that prepubescent or puberty stage where a lot of things start happening in, in all of our worlds where new experiences, new opportunities, new things um, begin to work and if to borrow Boyd K. Packer's old phrase, the, the little factory starts churning and, and the body starts changing. So that then leads you into these older um, uh, youth years, 12, 13, 14. I'm curious what, uh, what your experiences were like, were like dating, um, receiving within the Mormon church the priesthood and how, um, and how you kind of understand, uh, understood and worked with those new changes. Yeah, so I would say, um, again, my goal was always to be as perfect as I could be. I didn't understand the miracle, which we can talk about later, but I understood that the more perfect I was, the less someone might see the major blemish in me. Um, but so I tried to be the normal kid. Um, and in uh, high school, I wanted to date because that was what I was supposed to do. And I would find the one girl that I could be comfortable around and we would go out once or twice or we would go to a school dance or things like that. Um, but always I would break it off because I realized it was unsustainable. And more so is I hated the fact that I would actually like this person, but I knew that they liked me too, and I could not like him in that manner. And so I would break it off, which would kind of confuse them as well, the girls. 
Um, but ultimately, um, if I went on a, if I went on a, uh, you know, group date or things like that, I was far more fascinated in the guys that were on the date than I ever was with my own date or any of the other girls there. And it was just a constant struggle of how do you not let those thoughts be the most important thing in your head and try to be and act as normal as you could so that nobody would ever find out. How does someone act um, as normal as you can? Uh, Some, sometimes I often laugh because um, I think gay people deserve Academy Awards for their levels of acting and the pretension, uh, trying just, just to be straight. Look, so people that know me know that I um, am involved in community theater and I've um, played a number of roles on the stage live and had a blast doing it. And it's funny that at times people will ask me about my acting background or things like that. And, and I generally will tell people I learned to act at a very young age because I knew if I didn't act a certain way and, and you learn these things because when you do something that you're not supposed to mom or dad or brother, or even cousin would say, dude, that's not the way you're supposed to act. And you realize, whoops, I've, you know, I I've let my guard down. And then you just double down on trying so hard to pretend to be somebody else. As you say, trying hard to be, somebody else um, and you've you've talked a lot about change and hiding behind this fortress i'm just understanding through your story that you're now beginning to build those walls and those um those closets that start binding us to narratives and binding us to the expectations of other people in a typical mormon experience especially uh, post high school there comes the opportunity to serve a mission. Um, and I say opportunity tongue in cheek because f most Latter-day Saints will, all, uh, will agree that the church requires uh, its young men to serve missions. But for gay men, many who have sat in the same chair you're sitting in, um, they often use the mission experience to do exactly what you were just describing, um, to help fix, change, um, alter their course, to help them become different people or uh, parts about them uh, become different in a more um, Mormon central, Mormon uh, congruent way, specifically changing sexuality. As you uh, were in high school and preparing to serve a mission, was there uh, that experience in your life where you contemplated serving that mission in an effort, um, and you alluded to the word miracle, uh, to fix or change who Richard was. Yeah, so um, I actually went to BYU right after high school. I literally did not even stay home during the summer. I moved down and started school right away. And um, I, at the time, I believed I would not serve a mission. And I believe that for two reasons. One, I truly believe that the prophet and those that would choose a mission assignment for me would know deep down that I wasn't worthy to be on a mission because of who I was, not because of what I did, but just because of who I was. So I didn't want to risk that. So I just decided I wasn't going to go on a mission. So I went to BYU, started school, but BYU, there's a ton of pressure, especially on an 18, soon to be 19 year old man that you don't really have a choice. I was in the BYU marching band and I can remember becoming close to a girl who was from um, Nephi and in thinking, could I ever marry a girl? I thought this was somebody who was nice enough to me that I could maybe do that. And she flat out told me I would never marry anybody who had not served a mission. And so I, I then had this realization, I didn't have a choice, I had to, and I was terrified because of who I was, but at the same time, I knew that if I was gonna fulfill the Mormon dream, I really had no choice. And so I did um, put my mission papers in, uh, and I was called to serve in the Bangkok, Thailand mission, which was, um, 
I don't, I mean, I kind of thought I would go to England because that was what my family background was. Um, but, um, when I found out I was going to Thailand, didn't know much about it, but I was very excited about the prospect of going literally to the other side of the world to serve a mission. Um, sometimes when we talk about those, uh, foreign country missions for, for people in our situation, it, it's kind of a blessing, this idea that I will completely lose myself in the work. Um, but also I'm learning a new language. I'm in, I'm immersed in a new culture and that maybe provides some cover or some opportunity for some people to finally kind of turn a new leaf and become a completely new person. Yeah. So, um, I would say the mission was foundational for many things. First of all, before I left, um, a member of the stake presidency pulled me aside. And I think maybe deep down inside, he kind of knew more about me than I wanted him to. And he said, Richard, if you faithfully serve this mission, you will come back a different person. Now, <clears throat> what specifically he meant, I didn't, it didn't matter. What I heard him say was, if I serve the mission well, I would come home a straight man. And that's where I learned about the miracle of this ability to change from gay to straight. Um, so my gosh, when I, in the MTC, I wanted to learn the language better than everybody else did. I wanted to work harder. And as I served the mission, first of all, I, I fell in love with the Thai people, the Thailand in itself. Um, but I wouldn't say people liked me in terms of other missionaries because I was probably the hardest working missionary there. Whether when I was a DL or a ZL, um, those were times for me to really crack the whip on my fellow missionaries, right? And those acronyms are uh, district leader. And district zone leader and zone leader, yes. So district leader is over for those who aren't Mormons who have listened to the uh, podcast. A district leader is a missionary who's in charge of a handful, usually one, two, or three companionships, so six or so missionaries in a very specific uh, area. A zone leader is then over district leaders with 10 to 13 um, different companionships, and then you have, uh, this is kind of the structure of how missions work. So just a little background there. Yeah. So so you were, you were the... You were the rigid one. You were the oh, uh, I, a pro, uh, the apostle in training. Yes, people, other missionaries thought I, I was too hard, too serious, too everything. And even, um, it was funny because as much as I loved everybody, um, even members of the different branches, they weren't a big fan of Elder Mitchell because Elder Mitchell didn't want to have fun and games and, and hang out and things like that. He just wanted to keep working until we were supposed to be home. Um, and... I would even add the fact that I was called to be a district leader or a zone leader became proof to me through the process that if I just worked hard enough, if I just served hard enough, the Lord was going to accept my sacrifice. And then I would receive this blessing of change. It didn't happen, <laughs> but how does someone, um, realize and, w and what did it mean to you as you're putting in the scriptures say all your heart my mind and strength as you're giving it your all and it must feel like a gut punch every time you wake up in the morning and say i'm still gay yeah um, how does someone emotionally and mentally handle all of that I, I would definitely say post mission was very, very difficult for me because, um, yeah, I'm, I, I, I honestly thought when I got home that things would be so different. Um, but as I got home and maybe as I shed the cloak of the white shirt and tie and badge, um, it, not only do you realize you're still gay, but you real you come to think all of that was for nothing. Like I did this and I would be mad as I knelt and prayed and things like that. I was more furious with God that I had kept my part of the bargain, but I didn't feel like he was keeping his 
Like, why, why, why not just let me have this one thing? Um, so yeah, gut punch is a great way to describe it, but I would say from a mental standpoint, it's years and years of, um, emotional difficulty to deal with, um, because as you realize you failed and to some degree you accept the fact that it was your failure, not God's failure, you're still willing to try it again. Which is why, you know, at a future point in my life, when I'm asked to become a bishop, I thought this of all things was going to be that time that I could finally prove that I was worthy. Um, can I share the story of how I even became a bishop? Before we get to the bishop okay. story. Yeah. Um, I, I want to, I want to, I want to just lead us into I, I, th I think a, we have a great opportunity to talk about, we discussed the mission yeah. and how the mission didn't fix you. You're, you're back at BYU post-mission. You're looking at all of these external factors. Typically, and, and you alluded to it early in the episode, if the mission couldn't fix you and you couldn't fix yourself, then there must be someone out, someone out there who has the tools or the capability of fixing you. Did that happen? And we talk about conversion and aversion therapy, or how, how did that unfold for you to make that transition from, okay, God, you didn't fix me after I put all my effort in, but maybe there could be someone else out there who can fix me for me. Yeah, sure. Uh, so aversion ther therapy for me came as a result of me while at BYU going and seeking out um, help from a mental health professional. Um, I initially told him that what I really wanted help with was uh, what I considered to be a difficult problem with masturbation. And he wanted much more of a deep dive, so I became very... Um, uh, truthful to him about my attraction to men. And uh, he put me on this path of aversion therapy, which was literally to take images or videos or other, um, even could be smells and things like that, that would be very significantly adverse and then apply those anytime you have this thought about a man um, uh, I can remember thinking I went to him to stop masturbation, but he actually encouraged, encouraged me to masturbate because what he wanted me to get to was a point where I could successfully masturbate to the thought of a woman and not a man, which I was never able to achieve, but, um, that was the whole goal. And so, yeah, um, you're, you're absolutely right. God wasn't going to fix me. So what what professional out there could basically fix this. But I think through that process also came the knowledge that I had to actually get married to a woman um, for this to completely be successful. How do you get to that point? How do you get, because did that, did, did that knowledge, did that education, did that suggestion that you have to marry a woman come through the aversion therapy program? Did it come through, um, I mean, clearly, that wasn't part of the missionary discussions that that's not a verse that you read in the book of mormon that says if you um if you aren't able to overcome this on your own uh, a mission will fix you or if the mission didn't fix you then a marriage will fix you if a marriage didn't fix you then clearly having children will fix you Wh where do you receive that knowledge that education that promise that something like that is the balm of gilead the thing that will will help. I think it does, you know, it, it's a multifold attack in a sense. Um, I can recall a very direct uh, conversation with my mission president before leaving Thailand, where his um, counsel to me was to find a woman and get married. Uh, knowing that was going to be a difficult thing, I just um, sort of immersed myself in uh, BYU. But then I got very active in young single adult programs and things like that to try to help me find a wife. Um, 
and you have to understand in Mormon culture, you cannot reach the celestial kingdom without a wife as a man. So it was, it was necessary. There just was no getting around it. Um, but the more I dated and the more I involved myself in these activities, the more I realized that I was never going to be successful um, in marrying a, um, a, a girl. So what came from that was for me to remember how much I love the Thai people and reaching back. And I always stayed in communication with um, uh, members of the various branches that I had uh, served in. And um, there was one young lady that I reached out to several times and we became pen pals. And eventually I felt like this was somebody I could marry. And it does kind of go back to something you said earlier. I thought she was a safe bet because she would never really figure me out where to marry the typical white girl from BYU was going to be a very dangerous thing to do. And so um, eventually she came from Thailand to the, to the States and we ended up getting married in the temple, which again was one more pinnacle uh, point in my life where I thought this was the next step to gaining that miracle. Um, children came very naturally after that, um, in terms of what we were supposed to do. Um, it was never very natural in a physical sense, but, um, uh, I have four beautiful children that I will never regret and, um, uh, are uh, an important part of my life. But, um, ultimately I think as a Mormon man, the, the, the path to the celestial kingdom is very well mapped out. And so you either make a choice to follow that path or you make a choice not to. And in my situation, I thought it was just that much more important to do because I was trying not only to reach the celestial kingdom, but to reach the celestial kingdom as a straight person, not a gay person. The um, cynic in me, and I only do this for interview purposes because we both have stories of mixed orientation marriages, but I know there are people who are listening and watching um, as you relate that story will immediately say, um, but Richard, uh, you used that woman as a pawn. You, um, you in a very real way, um, put her happiness and opportunities at risk in an effort to try to fix or change something about you. How do you respond to something like that? Well, number one, it is it is an absolute true statement. And if there's any reason to change the church's stance on gay men marrying women, it's this, that you're not only making your own life difficult, you are in a sense ruining the life of a beautiful person who didn't deserve this. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie, The Policeman, but I recently saw that and it, and it has a very similar story and it only made me re-understand just how much I hurt her in the process of trying to fix me. So yes, it is, uh, it, I, I would never step away from that. Was there any discussion about sexuality prior to you getting married? Definitely not prior, but early on in our marriage, um, we did have discussion about the fact that I was attracted to men. Um, but this all happened at the same time as me uh, going from a college situation at BYU to entering to uh, entering the United States Army. And um, in the army, we lived under a don't ask, don't tell policy. And so between that and the church, um, my wife at the time and I just made the decision that being anything other than straight was um, not possible. Uh, so we agreed to make it work. What, uh, I'm just curious year wise, chronologically, where are we at? Um, 
typical, I'm, I'm guessing we're Clinton administration where don't ask, don't tell was happening. Yeah. So I actually entered the army right before the Clinton administration. So I actually had to sign a document that said, I am not a homosexual, um, as part of the entrance into the military process. Uh, and I, and I remember thinking I could do that in good conscience because I I wasn't a homosexual by choice and I wasn't acting on homosexuality. So I was okay to do that. But, um, uh, I, so I entered the military in 1990. Um, and then, uh, don't ask, don't tell came out in 93. Tell us, uh, cause this is fascinating territory. I think for me, just as an interviewer, um, what is, what it's like, um, to be not only a Mormon in the military, um, but one who is closeted, surrounded uh, in groups, predominantly uh, men, uh, uh, male-centric and male-driven. What was that experience like? Uh, harder to bury who and what you are, being surrounded by so many men? And then also, was there kind of a different perspective uh, or way you were treated because you also were Mormon? Um, yeah. Um, so... Uh, first of all, if, it, going through any kind of military training as a gay person is super difficult because you're thrown in situations, for instance, time is a big factor for all of this. And so simple things like taking a shower, you had to do it in a big open shower where there are multiple guys that are standing less than, you know, a foot and a half from each other and a drill sergeant on the outside telling you go, 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 go kind of a thing. Um, but I remember reaching back to my aversion therapy, um, uh, skills to try to not have something terrible happen, i.e. even, you know, just a, an inclination that I was interested. Um, so yeah, f from the very beginning, it was very, very hard. Um, being a Mormon, I think, uh, maybe not as hard in the military, but definitely there were times because lots of things like just drinking or using swear words or things like that, that couldn't be a part of my life are a part of everything around you. And, um, I, honestly, I, I use the military just like I used my former wife. I used it as a location or a place to be that would keep me safe because I wasn't allowed to be gay in the army. So therefore I couldn't be gay. And every day I would live my life to try to be, um, obviously a man's man. Um, my military career, I, to be quite clear, I went in with just the thought of getting the GI bill so I could go back to school because I wanted to become an attorney, a lawyer. Um, after going in, I actually loved the life and I felt like it was probably the safest place for me to build a career and stay, um, straight, so to speak. Uh, so like everything else in my life, I poured everything into that career. Um, I was considered a fast tracker, which simply meant that I was promoted over my peers. I was, um, there are, uh, military training, uh, programs that you go through where you're competing against hundreds of other very highly qualified soldiers. And every single course of that nature that I went to, I was deemed what they called the distinguished graduate, which meant I was the number one um, graduate of those classes. And I did that over and over. And um, looking back, I know the reason I did it is I had to prove to all these other men that I was worthy. I, I think is probably the best word I can ever use, whether it's the church or the military or even my, my former spouse, it was constantly trying to prove this worthiness or this level of perfection because the other flaw had to be hidden. And I think deep down inside, I wanted for this idea that if anybody ever found out about the other flaw, they would see so many other redeeming qualities about me that that would not be so important anymore. That's such a great point. And in fact, I don't know if I've even had that response 
in all the many interviews, and I think it is 100% accurate that sometimes we get to the point where we say, okay, if they do find out about who and what I am, if, if someone does put all these pieces together and, and is able to stand back and look at the actual photo on all these puzzle pieces, hopefully they'll realize all of the other things that I did will cloud um, this one little part about me. And as crazy as this sounds, like in the military, I would get trophies and I would get medals and I would get all these tangible things that I was always going to be able to show as proof that that wasn't who I was. Look at the wall, look at all the certificates, look at all the medals, look at all the, you know, the, the tangible things that I've received because I was better than everybody else in the military. And, um, I mean, even thinking back to it, the hardest part of it is it plays a huge toll because it goes back to this constant, um, pretending and constant, um, acting and nobody can live on a stage their entire life. But that was what I had to do was I had to, I, I could never drop the guard. And so it's exhausting. It's exhausting and it's also disingenuous. The, the reality here for a lot of people, and this um, the listener may or may not understand kind of this principle, but the, uh, we, also, we often talk about in this space, um, use two terms, uh, authenticity and honesty. Those two terms are, are used and thrown around um, a lot in discussion of this topic. And I think you bring up a really great um, example of authenticity and honesty. Yes, you had a whole wall full of these trophies. You had a whole wall of these accolades. But those represented somebody who was fictitious in a very real way. They represent um, the awards and accolades of a character that you created for the world to see. Deep down, inside or behind all of those trophies and awards uh, was the real Richard that was hidden. And no one was able to get to know that Richard. And so often when you see those trophies and accolades that hang on those shelves, you say to yourself, the authentic part of me didn't earn those. The person I created earned all of those. And there can be some levels of discomfort and some levels of disassociation when it comes to the realization that who the world gets to see and who the world gets to praise doesn't match who I see inside myself. It's very true. Um, I would even add one of the things I loved about the military was you got to move every three years or so. So what that meant for me is I didn't have to build deep relationships with anybody because I was going to leave them. And this was all pre Facebook and email and things like that. So when you left, you left and you never talked to these people again. And so it, it gave me the excuse that I didn't need to build a deep and lasting relationship with anybody because that was too risky. Um, yeah, so um, the military provided me this really safe haven um, and the church only helped it because wherever I went, um, they gave me an opportunity to serve. And in that service, I was able to also be a different person. So now we finally get to the part uh, where I would love to hear your bishop story. So, yeah. so th thanks, for th thanks for the deviation, <laughs> but I thought that was important to be able to kind of tie all that in and now kind of understand how uh, becoming a bishop was important um, to the unfolding of, of your story as well. Sure. Um, and, and I'm glad that you did also, because I think it would have it, it would have left out an important um, connector in this whole story. So in the military, when you're given a new assignment, you don't get to make a choice where that is. But very oddly, I was um, stationed in Germany and I get a call from what's known as Department of the Army, where they call to um, they, they basically tell me, Mr. Mitchell, by the way, I was considered Mr. in the army and that's very rare for most people, but my, um, my career path, 
uh, was that of what we call a chief warrant officer, but we call them misters. We don't call them by their actual rank. So I was always Mr. Mitchell in the army. And I get this call, Mr. Mitchell, we're thinking about sending you to Fort Hood. Now Fort Hood is in Texas. It was not where I wanted to go. And for many, many reasons, I didn't want to go there. But more importantly, I had this very distinct and strong feeling inside me that I should tell them I don't want to go to Fort Hood, which you just don't tell the Department of the Army. Well, I didn't tell them that. What I said was, would you do me a favor and reconsider? Because I just feel like Fort Hood is not going to be the best place for me to go. And to their credit, two weeks later, they call me and they say, look, we've changed it. Instead of sending you to Fort Hood, Texas, we're going to send you to Colorado. And immediately I had this great feeling about going to Colorado. When I get there, I am immediately called to be in, uh, the young men's president and thought that was a great calling. And I loved working with the young men. And then three months later, we have a split in our stake. And in that process, our bishop is going to become a member of the new state presidency. So I go to the uh, state conference that morning and Elder Kikuchi, who was a member of the Quorum of the Seventy, um, tells me he needs to meet with me. So I go in to meet with him and he tells me that they're going to call me to be the bishop of the ward that I was in. Um, I immediately thought back to my dad's situation in choosing not to baptize me. And I thought, Richard, with the flaws that you have, you're doing nothing that would pre uh, prevent you from being a good, solid bishop. So I accepted the calling. Now, the backstory is my bishop at the time, who's now in the stake presidency, Call, uh, calls me in and he's like, I need to tell you this story. And he, what he tells me is that he had taken a number of names to Elder Kikuchi to consider for being the bishop of the ward. And that Elder Kikuchi had responded to him, none of these men are going to be the next bishop. Go back, look at the membership in your ward and bring me new names. My bishop tells me he only brought back one name, and that was mine. And in that process, Elder Kikuchi made the decision that I would be the next bishop. Now, why that was important to me at the time is because it was validation to me from God that regardless of my flaws, regardless of who I was, I was who he wanted to be as bishop of that ward. And the crazy thing is, I'm out now, right? And members of that ward know that I am gay at this point. I still have friendships from that ward. I still have many of the young men and the young women that I used to work with as a bishop who are good friends to me this day, who talk to me on a daily basis on, on Facebook and things like that. So, and, and by the way, I was the hardest working bishop that one could be because it was going to be the pinnacle of earning that miracle just just to clarify because i um you weren't out as the bishop you're out now um, yes just in hindsight those re those relationships and opportunities that you had as a bishop have now paid dividends down the road um, even even to this day being on the other side of the aisle yeah, correct they didn't sever as a result of me coming out that's right what was your um, family relationship like uh, serving a, as a bishop? Just, uh, I think just my curious. Yeah, I, my kids never liked it because th no one wants to be the bishop's kids. Um, my former wife did not like it because she felt like I put more energy into being a bishop than I did being a husband. Um, so I think overall it was not a great, uh, situation for my family. Um, but for me personally, it was, um, it was a tremendous experience. As a bishop, but this is not a question I'm able to ask a lot of people who sit in the studio and, and share their story, but I've always been curious, especially for bishops who also identify somewhere along the spectrum. Um, were there opportunities for you as a bishop to counsel with, um, 
and sometimes even administer uh, church rules and regulations against um, LGBTQ people? And if so, what were those experiences like? So I don't, my entire time as a bishop, nobody ever revealed to me um, being a member of the LGBTQ community. No one ever said they were gay. Nobody ever mentioned to me anything like that. So I can't say that I got to minister to anybody that I knew in that situation, but um, I, I had many opportunities to minister to people over sex related things. And, um, for good or for bad, I was a very compassionate Bishop when it came to this sort of thing. If I can recall a sister, um, who was in trouble for adultery while her military husband was in Korea. And I can remember taking a very loving and, um, more pragmatic approach to it rather than the standard, um, she needs to be disfellowship. She needs to be, um, considered for, um, stake level, you know, retribution or, uh, anything like that. So uh, I would just say I was, um, a much more compassionate Bishop when it came to people revealing, I can remember the first sister who revealed to me that she had a problem with masturbation. And I was shocked because I didn't even think that was a thing to be honest. Um, but I can remember again, being very compassionate with her. I can also remember heartache. I can remember a young man who was a soldier. So not, not a, a teenager who came to me and said that he had a masturbation problem and how he used to duct tape his, um, his pajamas, uh, to his waist and things to prevent himself from doing things in the night and just thinking, if only, if only this wasn't such a bad thing, then maybe a young man like this wouldn't feel so obligated to take extreme measures against something that personally I felt like was, an, uh, it was nothing. And so again, I was far more compassionate with people like that. Um, but I was also troubled by a stake president who felt like it was mandatory for us to ask um, and I can remember my brother who also served as a bishop told me he never thought it was okay to ask a young man if they masturbated. So I accepted his, um, you know, his philosophy over my stake presidents. I can remember a stake president saying, if a young man ever showed up in anything other than a white shirt, he was definitely having sex and you needed to talk to him. And I just thought these were things that were not my business. I think this is a there, I'm certain there are people shaking their heads as they listen to this and say, this is, this is, a reason, this is another example of why uh, the Mormon church um, has a problem in its leadership ranks by hiring uh, or essentially calling people into these positions of trust and authority without any training and without any, not only uh, mental health training, uh, sexual health training, or understanding. The, the, the church's view on sexuality and the just very simple ways that we mature and progress is so archaic and so conservative and so orthodox that the real lived experiences of people do not match the orthodoxy of the religion. And that is so problematic, especially as you've kind of discussed this, when you sit in positions of authority across the desk from people who are bearing their soul, who also... Um, have have experienced some extreme levels of trauma the fact that you're duct taping your pajamas to your skin uh, in order to prevent something very natural uh, is evidence that we have a problem within the church uh, especially as we're kind of unfolding these sensitive and uh, difficult subjects of natural humanity yeah it, it, it is. It's terrible. I, I, I'll even share this. I got in trouble once as a bishop because you mentioned sitting across the desk. When I first became bishop, I was never comfortable with me being on this side of the desk and the member being on that side. So I turned the desk sideways so that when I was sitting across from them, we were in full view of each other. And my stake president actually balled me out over that and told me that that was inappropriate, that I needed to create this, um, you know, this hierarchy between me as the bishop and the member and put this desk in between us as a, a symbol or sign of that. 
Um, so even as a bishop, I wouldn't say I was a traditional bishop in the sense of um, I bucked the system, maybe. And what city, um, what area did you live in when you were a bishop? Colorado Springs, Colorado. So the church still has a fair amount of Mormon influence? Huge. Um, uh, yeah, several stakes just within Colorado Springs. It's also a very heavy military city. Not only do you have Fort Carson where I was at, you have a very large um, Air Force base and the Air Force Academy. So you've got both things. You've got very heavy church influence, very heavy military influence. Um, it was a unique place to live for sure. The, the reality that you're sitting in the studio sharing your story, um, your latter gay story, means that uh, this wasn't sustainable. That at some point, this path to uh, opening up, this path to coming out of that closet, um, left the bishop's office and went into a different direction. I'd love to kind of explore and understand um, how we got to where we're at today. So when I finally retired from the army, there was a major change, I think, psychologically for me, and that was I no longer had to hide who I was and fear losing my career. This is because uh, the government repealed Don't Ask, Don't Tell. No, this was because when you retire, you're no longer under the obligation to live the same sort of rules or laws that we lived. The chains were gone. They were. They were from the from the military standpoint. So what I thought I could do was be safe somewhere in between. The first thing I did was I wanted and needed to um, come out to my family. So I actually held a family meeting at my dad's house to reveal that I was gay. And <laughs> I mean, I know everybody says this, but it was almost maddening to have my brothers and sisters say, well, duh, we always knew that you were. Um, but also that was uh, probably the starting point of the major fracture in my marriage because for my former spouse as long as we kept it a secret then we could we could make this work but the fact that it was now out um, ruined everything and um, i needed to have some connection to people. I didn't feel like I needed to have sex or to do things that I wasn't necessarily supposed to do, but I definitely felt the need to have connection with other gay men. And so I didn't know how to find that. I had just moved from um, Georgia to uh, Salt Lake City. And my dad, who is a great person said, Richard, if it doesn't exist, then create it. So I used to post and um, hold a once a month meeting in my home for other gay members of the church. And it started out with a few people and pretty soon it grew to where we had 40 and 50 people. And then somebody showed up and says, well, you know, it's cool that you're doing this, but we have groups all over the valley that already does this. So I quit doing them in my home and I became very active in the what we refer to as LDS SSA groups. We weren't allowed to say gay. We had to say we were same sex attracted. Um, but yeah, I, I just became extremely um, connected to those groups. But the more I did, the more my former wife could no longer take it. So typically, uh, this, this LDS, Latter-day Saint, same sex attracted groups, um, have other kind of fringe groups that become um, involved in this space. I can think of um, groups like Jim, this journey into manhood. Um, I think of groups like North Star that are all faith affirming. Did, did you ever attend or participate in any of these, um, which now many have been deemed controversial, uh, kind of fringe or side groups that had this intersection with Mormonism? Yeah, so I, um, I had heard about Jim. I was actually offended by the word or the, the, the name journey into manhood because I thought I am a man. I don't need somebody to 
teach me how to become a man. Um, so I, I didn't want to go. I didn't want to attend, even though I had friends that did and talked great things about it. I eventually did get um, told to do it. And yes, I did participate in North Star. I would say more as a participant. I was never, you know, a leader or um, active in the sense that uh, I was, I, I attended different things, sure. Um, but I finally made the decision to go to Journey into Manhood. And um, I was very upset and very frustrated through the process, partly because it, it seems like they spend a lot of time trying to convince you it's your dad's fault that you are gay. And then it's your mom's fault that you're gay or it's a brother's fault. But there was a reason you were gay. And I felt like the weekend was designed to help you figure out what that one thing was that made you gay. I had a great relationship with my dad. I had a great relationship with my mom. I'm very close to my brothers and sisters. None of those things that they tried to you know, convince me of was true. And so I would say that, um, I learned a lot about myself through the process. I was also scared to death for other people who were emotionally, um, frail, but were being put through what really was emotional tragedy, um, through this process. And I cried for them because I knew they were going to be broken through this process where I would survive. I want to talk a, a little bit about the, the activities that happen within those um, uh, journey into manhood, gym um, experiences, and others that are similar to that. Uh, because you, I think you described some of those, ex uh, there is a very real uh, intent to help people uh, create uh, a reason as to why you're gay. The, the church and, and these groups specifically uh, want to say that there are outside uh, nature factors that contributed to uh, homosexuality. So they will say a uh, overbearing uh, father or distant uh, father, overbearing mother are uh, examples of reasons why people like uh, you, Richard, are gay. And then uh, as part of these meetings, there are mannequins that are set up that you uh, use a baseball bat to yeah. beat. Um, there are often rebirthing ceremonies where people are put under blankets and then you literally come out of the womb a new person. There are uh, opportunities to write slurs and, and language uh, to describe the way you felt about your distant father. Even encouraged to use words that you, you would never use because you were told never to use those kind of words. Like you were just supposed to be mad writing letters to your family members, um, even God uh, as retribution um, and, and a way to facilitate uh, and distribute pain and trauma. These are all activities that happen at uh, Journey into Manhood. Familiar? Yeah, um, also writing a letter to your golden father who wasn't your father because he was not good enough to be the golden father. But the problem was my dad was, he was my golden father. And so all of these things that they kept pushing on you were not, they, they didn't fit me. And, and so the frustration in gym for me, and they called it rug work, which I thought was just a pathetic way to say yes. And yet, did I take a baseball bat to an effigy of somebody? I did because if I didn't be, if I wasn't a full participant, then I, again, I was being in trouble for being, you know, not, um, living the, the, the program or whatever, not agreeing to the program. Anyway, long and short is I, I want to say this, um, in learning so much about myself, it really was Jim that made me make that decision that I was gay because it was who I was supposed to be. And I did have a very spiritual experience of being on my knees and begging my Heavenly Father to please make me whole, make me straight, change me. And I literally got an answer as real as Joseph Smith will say that he got his answer where God said, Richard, quit asking me to change you because you are exactly who I made you to be. 
So that was really a major changing point in my life where I was able to say, I need to be Richard. I got to quit acting. I've got to quit pretending. I've got to quit even in the way that I dressed and everything that was not a portrayal of a gay man. I finally had this ability to say this all needs to stop. And that resulted in my former wife asking for a divorce. That seemed to be the pinnacle of coming out of that closet. So I, I, as I listen to that, I think you had spent your whole life building a facade that wasn't who Richard really was. You had created this character. And now, um, for lack of a better term, you had to destroy that person. You had to eliminate who the old Richard was. But with that comes, in a very real way, collateral damage. You have a career, um, a history of, of your work, but you have a wife, you have four kids. How much of that can physically change? And how do you do that? Yeah, um, well, as much as I would love to, um, my ex and I don't have a good relationship at this point. And I think the hurt for her was just too much. Um, so I don't fault her for that, but um, yeah, we, we just simply don't have a relationship. And um, I, I have two girls who, love and adore me, make fun of me all the time because some of the physical changes was changing how I dressed and suddenly wearing skinny jeans and things that they only ever saw their dad in baggy clothes and, and uh, military uniforms and things like that. And they would tease me and everything, but they are um, a, a super important part of my life today. Um, but part of the damage is my relationship with my two sons and, um, and not having a good relationship with either one of them today. So uh, there's huge collateral damage. Um, and again, I, I feel, um, I, I, you feel guilty, but at the same time, you feel like the only way for you to progress is to be honest. It is to be authentic. It is to say no anymore to the living in a box that you don't belong in. How long were you able to, to hold off a change in your uh, perspective, uh, your belief, and your uh, commitment to Mormonism after making this public coming out? Um, I would say it was very quick, and it was quick in part because as I would go back to church, um, I, I, people would say things in um, priesthood meeting or things like that that were, in my opinion, anti-LGBTQ. Um, I can remember actually being in a um, uh, priesthood meeting right after the um, uh, change in the marriage uh, equality law. So uh, 2013-ish. Or 15. 15. 15. Yeah. So this was before I had separated from my spouse, but being in that meeting, and this is where I had already started to come out in terms of with my family and with friends and with work and everything else. And um, my own uh, home teacher, which I'll let you explain, but my own home teacher was teaching the priesthood lesson and he was banging on the desk and he was saying, we cannot stand for this. We cannot, you know, this is, um, you know, regardless of what the government says, we've still got to stand our ground sort of thing. And I can remember just thinking, we're never going to change. Like, we're never going to do this. But I had this very strong feeling to stop him and to say, number one, that there's somebody out in the hallway that can hear you banging and talking anti-gay stuff who is gay. Could be a primary kid, could be a, um, a, a young man or a young woman, could be a full-fledged adult. 
but this is what they get to hear at their own church, and it wasn't right. And then I made the comment, it, you act as if you don't even know a gay person. And he literally said, well, to the best of my knowledge, I don't. And I said, well, in fact, you do. And I felt that was my coming out at church and where, honestly, I felt even going to church was unsustainable because I could not even go in to a sacrament meeting or a priesthood meeting without feeling that there was a level of attack on me and the people that I love so much. And that was it. That, that's all it takes. The worry is how many other people are out in the hallway that also hear that, but don't have the strength or ability to step away. What is it like to walk away from the church, to walk away from generations of activity, to walk away from decades of, of righteous church service, of giving the church everything? I like to consider myself a, you know, a positive person. And so I can easily find fault in the church and it's almost very easy to document that and to show that this is very destructive. I think for me, I just like to let it be. So I choose not to attend church. I don't typically go out and bash the church. But I'm also not shy about talking about what ultimately happened to me as a result of my trying my best to be the good Mormon boy or adult and still feeling like the church left me. Um, and it, it did come to a point where I was excommunicated from the church. And so um, I, I don't have any feeling of wanting to go back. Um, but it doesn't change the fact that every day I'm still somewhere inside a Mormon. Um, things that I do, things that I choose to say, or it, the Mormon culture can't just suddenly be flushed out of you. And so even to this day, I would say there are aspects of the Mormon religion that I um, abide by, if you want to call it that. Um, but at the same time, I would say I have found it easier to acknowledge that some of this may not be um, may not be God given, it may be man given, and therefore, as a man, I can make my choices too. I love it. I I, I love the opportunity to uh, reclaim our individual autonomy, the opportunity to live the fullest measure of our creation, uh, the opportunity to be the creators uh, of our own destiny, and find those things that bring us uh, happiness and joy. Uh, so post-Mormon life, uh, post-heterosexual uh, marriage life, there has to be a learning curve here. Um, and how does someone like you begin the dating process to begin walking into a world that you have spent decades avoiding? Um, that had to, I, to me, it almost would sound like, uh, or metaphorically, like swimming upstream finally getting to the waterfall and then like just being drowned by all these opportunities and all these new emotions and new experiences and new things you had to learn. All things that we aren't given an opportunity to learn about or aren't trained to understand uh, as Latter-day Saints. Yeah, I, I definitely would say, um, First of all, it's it's overwhelming because you don't know what to do. And I would even say in the aspects of my LDS SSA life, um, there were opportunities to meet people. So I would um, gravitate to them as opposed to like, say, going to a bar or going uh, or even using a dating app or things like that. Um, but most of them were in similar situations where they were married still or working through their divorce, et cetera. So I would say for the most part, I just didn't consider this idea that I would like date and maybe fall in love with a guy. Um, but I actually, and I don't want to talk so much about the experiment, but I, there, I was given an opportunity to experiment, 
um, with a dating app. And so I did, and um, this is gonna be very boring, but uh, I fell in love with the first person that I met. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so I don't, I don't have all these experiences like um, a lot of great couples where I spent a lot of time dating a lot of different people. Um, I, I literally just fell in love with the first person that I had a chance to date. And uh, dare I say it, I, yeah, I'm married to that person today. <laughs> and I love it because uh, the audience didn't know this, but uh, this is a teaser episode um, as part uh, of three episodes that we're going to um, share Richard's story, um, his husband's story, and then the couple story as well. So I, I smile because we all have this intersection uh, in this story, which uh, to the viewer and listener, you're not going to expect what may come in, in these next uh, interviews, which is exciting and which is uh, part of this interview that makes me smile and I'm excited about. Uh, is there anything, um, as we kind of wrap your story, Richard, that you wanted um, the audience to know? Um, was there anything that you wanted them to specifically get out of your story that we haven't talked about yet? I, I, honestly, I think my closing remark would be this. With all of the great things that the church teaches you, there's this thought or teaching that basically says wickedness never was happiness. And so it's part of the reason why you think I can never go down that path of being a gay man because that is wicked. I'm so grateful that I don't believe that it is wicked. I'm so grateful that I know that it's not wicked. And with that, I have found joy that I never in my life thought was possible. And that joy is what sustains me every day. It's that joy that I wake up with every day, knowing that um, I, I am in a life that is so full of love, that is so full of um, silliness and happiness and things that just honestly weren't part of my life before. And so I think my thought is not to say, hey, you know, if you leave the church, everything's going to be perfect because it's not for a lot of people. Um, but at the same time, I would say if you believe that you cannot find joy post, it simply isn't true. I love that. And that's super profound. And Oh, I'm just glad. I'm glad that uh, the audience was able to uh, get to understand and know you um, in a more intimate and um, candid level. Thank you. Thank you for being vulnerable and sharing that part of your story. Thank you. And to the audience, um, thank you for the bait and switch and, and being a good sport about it. Not really a bait and switch, but we, uh, we, I am excited about this three-part interview uh, to be able to uh, kind of expand uh, Richard and Josh's story. So um, make sure you now catch, which is the very next episode, which will be Josh's story um, uh, after this one. And then um, up, up and coming is the couple interview as well. So thank you for giving us an hour of your time to better understand these experiences. If you have a specific uh, question or comment about things that we've talked about already, and you, if you haven't, make sure you use that chat feature in our YouTube and, and Facebook uh, platforms to be able to share those comments. And if you are uh, listening on an audio version of this podcast, we invite you to subscribe to this channel and also give us a rating. Uh, not a great opportunity on the audio podcast side to be able to share uh, the stories and comments about uh, specific episodes. So that's why we love to point people to YouTube and to Facebook. And where a large portion of our YouTube audience uh, doesn't identify as Latter-day Saints, it's always a fascinating um, discussion and opportunity to see where other conservative uh, leaning or uh, conservative based uh, listeners uh, kind of interact with and, and uh, ingest episodes like this. So we appreciate all those who are participating outside of uh, these podcast episodes. We will be back for part two and three coming up, but I always uh, close the podcast with the same um, beautiful thought. It's stories like yours, it's stories like mine, and it's stories like Richard's that help us each continue writing our own Latter-day Story.